Welcome to Services Marketing for week nine. So, here's how it's gonna work. In the, t in the lecture, we are going to engage in experiential learning. Uh, it will require individual and group work. And the more people we have, the merrier it will be. So please, if you're available on Monday, do show up. So the experiential aspect that we're looking for here is the idea of emphasizing the role of the other customer in the aspect of seduction and the production of service value. Obviously, we'll need to do a quick recap of uh, uh, what we know, what we don't know, but here's the key to what's gonna happen this week. I'm rolling out the Xboxes and the PlayStation and the laptop, and there will be Rocket League, Beat Saber, Overcooked 2, and Untitled Goose Game. And you're gonna be asked to play those games or watch people playing those games during the session. And th here's the anticipated way of how it's gonna work. Should be about 20 minute rounds, so we should be able to pull off uh, three, possibly four of these, depending on how cleanly everything uh, rolls over and transfers. A little bit of task familiarizing, player assignment, getting people in positions, about 15, 20 minutes on the game time. There is an A3 sheet, which we will explain a little bit in a moment, uh, and a few minutes swap over between rounds. Hopefully we should get through, like I've gone conservative in the estimate here of two or three rounds of experience. Any luck we should be able to pop uh, in a 120 minute window, we should be able to pull off 80 minutes worth of um, operational time. And then at the end, there'll be a breakdown, debrief and discussion. Now for all of you who are currently going, oh, I was gonna skip class because it's assignments, exams, everything else. It's, it's gonna be experiential. You're not going to be able to get the same experience watching the playback that you will from being in the room. Now, there's a little mention before of the uh, A3 sheet annotation. Roughly, uh, the lines will be a little more visible on the, on the printout and the A3. You're gonna be asked to take one of three roles. You're either, so we're gonna be using my copy of Untitled Goose Game on my laptop. So there will be three, two to three rounds of people playing the goose game. And one person will be navigating as the driver, they'll be using the, the computer. There'll be a couple of observers, but there also is the opportunity for the role of the advisor, someone to be saying, hey, go this way, do this. Uh, sometimes the advisor, if you've played the goose game before, you'll be the informed advisor. Sometimes you'll have information to inform your advice. Same goes, uh, so this is a one player, multiple observer, mo one or more advisors. Overcooked 2, it will be on the PlayStation 4. It will have four participants, possibly a fifth, if we've got the numbers, uh, a fifth person to be the manager to oversee the whole process. So it might tie in a little bit of last week's stuff. Uh, again, Beat Saver brings us back to an individual participant, Spares are on the observation fleet, and advisors, people telling, guiding, hey, do this, do that, try this way. Rocket League, we have two people, uh, we have two Xboxes and two copies of the game, so we should have two players. Each player can come with an advisor, or you can have a team coach, team captain, giving advice, and again, observers. So what we want to do is we want to rotate people through roles of being both the people who watch the game, people who play the game, people who advise others playing the game. There's a space for qualitative notes. Other in each role here, what are the others doing? What's the role of the others? And how are they influencing your experience? And a little score, score out of 100. So this is the experiential mapping. The games themselves, Untitled Goose Game, House House is an Australian based company operating out of Victoria, uh, funded in part by some Victorian state government funding. 
Beat Saber is a so Untitled Goose Game is a it's a stealth game, um, stealth puzzle object manipulation game. Beat Saber is the virtual reality, so it's a VR headset and handheld objects. Um, we'll need a little bit of space in the room to make certain this is done safely. The Rocket League is basically what happens if you take cars, soccer, and a distinct disregard for physics and physics modelling. And Overcooked 2 is, I'm just going to leave it at a cooperative cooking simulation video game because those are a set of words I'd never expected to say, let alone see in a sentence. So I'm looking forward to this. I think it's going to be a great experience and it's experiential. The idea is we want people to come in and be the experience for other people in the room. So the players who engage are going to be helping the others in the room both learn the services marketing, but also have the experience. Now, briefly mention this, this is the player assignment. Uh, we have two single player games, one four player game, and one paired two player game. Uh, the coach roles are people being a coach or an advisor or a manager. Uh, each of these things we can talk about depending on the numbers on the day. Now, let's dive into some content and let's dive into some explaining. This chapter is looking at the role of how consumers co-create their services. So the chapter and the slides are going to really deal with this idea of the consumer as a, an active participant in their own value creation and their own satisfaction. We're going to take a highlights reel approach here because the central idea that's most important to us is this idea of the expert consumer, the novice consumer, and the spectrum between the two. A novice consumer is unfamiliar with the requirements of the exercise. New customers, new staff members. Now, as we mentioned this, by the way, one of the things we're thinking about as well is the old Ansoft matrix. If growth is based on recruiting new customers, if growth is through uh, new people, then you're dealing with novice customers on a regular basis. If growth is based through getting a current customers to use a product, use a service more frequently, it's a different type of customer. Also though, if you are fo functionally focusing on growth is based on getting your existing customers to use new products, you're going to be shifting people between expert and novice on a routine basis. So have your answer off in mind, have your, remember that all Elements of services and marketing loop together and interweave. So the concept here, the expert customer is someone who knows the purchase process for a particular good uh, or a particular service. They've got expertise. They've been through. They're the ones you walk into a, they walk into a familiar coffee shop and they can recite their order. They know what it is they want. They know the language of the product. The expert performer is someone who knows how to get the best out of their service. So the expert performer at the gym is someone who's trained quite a lot. The expert performer at the, uh, the expert performer actually at the hairdressers is someone who um, also knows how to get the best value from the time they're spending inside the hairdressing process. There is a difference though between an expert customer who knows how to order something particularly well and knows how to do the, cons the ordering engagement side versus how good they are at performing the actual service itself. One of the reasons we're running the uh, Xbox and PlayStation exercises is because I want people to experience in real time novice and expertise. Now, in terms of consumer performance, one of the questions of services marketing, and I don't care what Vargo and Lush and all the others say about co-creation, consumer performance is a much greater factor in 
service design than it is even in co-creation of value. Customers have roles to play. They need, for example, you go to the cinema, the idea is that you sit in silence and passively consume the content. You go to the football, the idea is that you cheer, actively vocalize. But it's not a sport versus art thing, because if you go to the tennis, you sit there silently and then you applaud politely. In golf, you all sit there quietly waiting for the performance of the sport versus at the professional wrestling where you are chanting and cheering and the performers are signaling to you how to engage. Uh, if you watch some professional wrestling clips, you will see the performers signaling to the crowd when to clap along, when to cheer, when to get involved, when to create the atmosphere that makes a good overall service performance of the wrestling show. So there is a script, there are scripts. Even in something as fundamentally basic as a teaching and learning environment, there are scripts that underpin each of the aspects of what we do. The key to good consumer performance is socializing your customer into the script so that they feel comfortable with the role that they will play and socializing them into knowing the cues. So it's a call and response performance between your staff member and your customers. Of course, you do occasionally need to remember uh, to the number of times I've had this happen in service encounters, particularly at my favorite restaurants, fast food restaurants, where I have answered the questions before the poor staff member has had a chance to ask them. And it's like, yeah, I order here a lot, just sorry, I'll wait for you to ask next time. I was ahead of the script. I was off script, I wasn't paying attention to my role and I was slowing down production because instead of it being super efficient by me giving the answers before they're asked, the system still had a sequence of cues that you had to respond through. The script was a call and response. So you need to ensure when you are mapping and you're working as a service provider, you're looking to the maps of to what extent is it a scripted encounter. Therefore, much like theater, it's call and response. Everyone knows their lines and responds. Or is it an improvised encounter? High contact, high variability, high inconsistency is improv. Your service encounters basically are yes and versus low contact where scripts are read and something like the telemarketing service banks where they have scripts that they need to follow. These, the scripts create consistency. Scripts mitigate inconsistency, lower heterogeneity, but also decrease the sense that it's humans interacting with humans. It comes very much uh, the fact that if you've got an automated voice response system, and I used to be able to out-talk the automated voice systems that no one else could use because I have a metallic service voice. Even down to when uh, the Canberra taxi services first brought in their uh, automated voice section, there was a particular error in the way that it had been coded. So the suburb to the north of us was Belconan, not Belconan. So I would use my robot voice, taxi for Belconan, ready, leave now. And the system would recognize my robot voice. Doing it to a human was quite unnerving for the, for the poor human. But also in the script, knowing that I freeform most of my scripts and I don't actually work to preset uh, scripted material, there is a 
as a consumer, I struggle with services that have a very tightly controlled script. It is difficult for me to engage somewhere where there is a sequence of call and responses because I get distracted and wander off from the script. So when we're tink tinkering with customer performance, the first idea is that you, again, market segmentation is absolutely central here because one of the segments that you need to be considering in this is the market segment of people who are new to the service and people who are experts at the service. This is a very simple segment. Am I selling to people who know what they're doing? Am I selling to people who have no experience? If I'm selling to people who know what they're doing, then I need to be very mindful of not randomly creating innovation for the sake of, oh, we innovated recently, we changed the scripts. Because if the script isn't failing for our target market, merely updating the script doesn't do anything valuable. It also decreases value because customers who previously felt that they were experts are now novices. And since they're having to relearn the script, they are also more vulnerable to wanting to change providers because, well, since I've got to learn a new routine anyway, what else is on the, the market? So this is one of the things, uh, this particular model here, the customer who is the expert performer also sits inside the Ansoft matrix as the selling existing customer, existing products, sell more to the existing customer. If you are doing subscription-based services, it may or may not be valuable. Um, if it's the all-you-can-eat, one-monthly fee, then you don't really mind whether you've got novices or experts as long as they keep paying again. If you're using individual event-by-event event payments, then expert performers become a valuable source of improved experience for the novices who are attending, so the other customers. In the subduction model, the experts can support, guide, and be part of the experience for the other customers, for the novices. The novices themselves can be something that you're brokering and selling off to the expert performers who are getting to showcase their skills and their abilities and show how much they know about the product. Now, uh, the, the short shopping list here is basically this idea. It's the previous model and text. But the keys are the creation of your service experts. Your service scape is valuable because this is the idea of the planting cues and clues within the service experience. But also your service scape is the service experience. So the better able someone is to navigate it and co-create, find what they need from their service experience, the more likely they are to be satisfied with it as an environment and to be able to guide others into accessing greater levels of value. The case in point always is a gym that the veterans who are training there using equipment in new and interesting ways give by simply going and performing and doing their gym routines, they are showcasing what you can do with the facilities. I mean, there have been a number of occasions I have been working out at the Anytime Fitness and gone, looked over at what someone's doing made a note of the machines and gone back and looked it up on YouTube as to what exactly that exercise was and how, how it works. I'm also not the kind of person who wanders up somewhere in the gym and says, hey, bruh, hey, bruh, explain to me how this, how you do the thing. I figure if they're training at four o'clock in the morning, 3 a.m., 2 a.m. when I'm training, they don't want to talk to people as much as I don't want to talk to people. The final thing, on this is loyalty and customer expertise do correlate to some extent. The better you get at a service, the more tolerant of it of failings, but also the more likely you are to be loyal because you've got a sunk cost of skill and knowledge. It also has occurred to me is that one of the things that 
I have accumulated over time is I have server script knowledges for defunct services. I know the way, I know several uh, map layouts of laser tag venues across Australia, none of which are still working, so I have useless information. So even when they redid their scripts, they changed one of the ways that they did stuff, people often, and this is one of the things you want to watch for, is this idea of the need for constant innovation does not gel with script management. You don't always have to make things new and better and improved. At the university, we are as guilty of this as anything else in the way that we flip over teaching styles or teaching behaviours. And look, this week when I just rolled in a bunch of Xboxes and Playstations, is changing the script of what you are used to doing in a classroom. I'm doing it intentionally because I want to create novice and expert customers, but I'm also doing it mindfully that this is a script change and I'm aware it will cause some problems, some discomfort, or some sense of, huh, we should do that more often, which will lower the value of other, other weeks on the old script. Now, a couple of things just to close out uh, in terms of pickups from the chapter. Wait, times, delays, lag, and other elements. These are central things. Uh, the book goes in, we spent a lot of time working on how to change wait times during service experiences. Uh, there's an eight, eight principles. I just want to briefly mention some of them because the key, again, you're going to experience some of them in the class. But fundamentally, it comes down to, do I feel that I am in control of my environment? If I have a strong sense of need for be, to be in control, a weight that I feel is certain, with purpose, has a waypoint or has a point. So it will be 15 minutes until the start. Excellent. I can count down. I know when things are going to start. I know I'm in pre-process. If during the production, it's like we've taken your order, uh, the chef expects it will be about 30 minutes until the food comes out. Perfect. Come back. Look, there's a huge, you know, the kitchen's lagging horribly. We can't render the food fast enough. Uh, it's going to be 45 minutes. Explained beats unexplained. However, the killer in this is the perception of equity, which means that you are looking at to what extent is the wait time, the perceived wait time of the other customer in the room, the other customers in the service, what is the perceived wait time that they are experiencing versus the perceived wait time that you are experiencing. And that becomes one of the most central aspects of whether people are satisfied or dissatisfied in a queuing behavior is the notion that the other people, I arrived here before they did and now they've been served before me. It's like, well, as was, exp <laughs> as was explained to me in a hospital uh, waiting room in a triage uh, scenario one time is what you want in a hospital waiting room is not to be the first customer that they admit. Because when you walk in there, if you are straight through those doors, your circumstances are way more severe than someone that they will park in queue. That said, that mileage will also vary in that the weight, the equity of the weight comes down to, do I feel that I've also been treated as seriously as the other customers in the room? Obviously, a solo weight is longer than a group weight, but that also is solo, no phone. If you are in a group weight scenario, then you've got people to talk to, people to co-create an experience with. If you're on your phone, you can also co-create that experience with the people you talk to via your portable telecommunications device, which is why people are always on their mobile phones on public transport these days, because they're taking out the solo weights. They're taking out the solo in process weight. 
And the other thing is that the more value is placed on a service, the longer people will wait. CF every queue and every theme park on the planet, and also any time driving to the coast during summer. You will queue if you see a value, and it's just a time price atop the total cost of the overall service product. And if you see, if that time price does not exceed the total cost, you're good to go. All right, the final, final thing that we wanna bring attention back to is Customer performance drives value. Perception of consumer performance also drives value. So you want the customer to both be in control and getting value, but feel in control. If the customer is coming at the other side of the service experience going, well, didn't think much of that. Uh, and this is one of the things, a challenge, a genuine service delivery challenge we have in higher education is as we increase the rate of self-service technology, things like this video, self-test exams online, people going, well, I didn't learn anything in that subject or I, I wasn't taught anything in that subject. You know, I was just expected to do the reading, watch the slides, do these self-check quizzes do all the self-assessment, self-learning, self-development, and you know, whilst I'm a better knowledgeable, greater person than I was 13 weeks ago, I wasn't taught anything. I had to co-create all my stuff. Perception becomes, again, it's a critical facet, critical factor here. Perception governs reality. The more you are involved in the production of your own service product, the greater extent it is that you, on the greater risk you have as a service provider, that the customer feels that they didn't need the service provider. Oh, I could have done that, or I did that myself. So we're watching for that balance between co-production, co-creation, and customers feeling that there wasn't a value, or that customers not valuing the role of the consumer in the, as, not valuing the role of the producer as the facilitator of the service. Also, uh, when it comes to customer performance, one of the things that technology is fundamentally stupid, artificial intelligence isn't. There's a, I'm gonna be old at you for a second. It has been 20 years of being told about neural networks and the coming of artificial intelligence and the rise of AI systems. The smartest thing on the planet is to slap a wrapper of branding and con artistry and say, oh, we use smart artificial systems and just channel the goddamn work out to a bunch of humans because humans do it better, faster, and more creatively than a bunch of code does. So AI doesn't have anywhere near as much of a say in consumer performance as the people selling AI would like to tell you it does. That said, if you want to get into selling AI, call me, all right, I can help. Uh, the question about technology imposing tighter scripts on customers, this is for the customers who behave themselves with the technology, uh, rather than people like me who try and figure out how to go around the technology. If this then that branch chains limit what you can do. It's a limited, it's flexibility within an established structure. All outcomes must be mapped, you must reach you will reach one of the mapped outcomes. And every mapped outcome has outcome 00 or outcome 99, which is divert and revert to human to deal with. All right, uh, just the last thing I want to quickly mention this week is, this is the exam question. There's an exam briefing video that exists, but basically this one, the thing I want to get your attention to is embrace or mitigate. When creating a marketing task, what challenges do services marketing face and how, a very commonly used theory in the subject, can be used to embrace or mitigate the concept? All right, the embrace or mitigate. This is a really important thing for you to do is that you're human, pick a side. Either use the theory to embrace take advantage of the problems that it creates and the solutions it del delivers, 
or mitigate, use it to reduce. So embrace is all about expansion, using it as a feature, mitigate is all about seeing it as a bug and limiting it. So embrace or mitigate, those are, that's a killer application. It's been throughout the subject, it's all the way through. Context is king, there is no, context is king, queen, prince, and the entire backup royal family. There is nothing in services marketing that I will have taught you that is an absolute. It's either something that you use and therefore embrace, or it's something that you reduce and therefore mitigate. And that's the pre-record for this week. Do try and show up to the class. Uh, if nothing else, Cambry Precinct spent a bunch of money on us, bought us some toys, bought us some hardware, and I will make some teaching and learning ex exercises out of this hardware to showcase to the other teachers that actually you can do cool and interesting things in your classrooms. So if this is where the role that you play in this class is to go first, embrace it, give me the opportunity to take forward this idea to the other lecturers and say, hey, we can do more than just stand and deliver lectures. There's the opportunity to be interesting. 